Good morning, everyone. It's a pleasure, a honor to, to uh, speak here uh, at this uh, important uh, climate justice uh, conference. I have a lot uh, to tell you. I've received a long list of the issues I had to cover during my uh, talk, so I will try to address all of them. I know I have too many slides. I know it. <laughs> but you will all have them afterwards and, and some of them on some of them there's a lot of text I don't want to read that I don't want you to read that here but sometimes it's to make sure that you are aware that these subjects are covered in the IPCC report there is a reference to, to it at the bottom of the slide and it would help you to uh, dig in further if if you wish so my apologies for going sometimes fast on a few slides. I will go also slow on some other slides at some points. And inspired by Elise yesterday, I will start with a poem, maybe justifying such a long talk on, on the science of climate change at the beginning of, of the day. It's from a Senegalese poet. In the end, we conserve only what we love, he wrote, we will love only what we understand, and we will understand only what we are taught. So I'd like to um, um, use as much as possible in my talk uh, and in my teaching this morning uh, the uh, content of the IPCC report. The IPCC stands for the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change, for which I have the honor to be one of the vice chairs. It's a panel of experts uh, which has been established a little more than 25 years ago by two UN organizations, the World Meteorological Organization and the United Nations Environment Program. Not to do additional research on climate change, but to do something that's even more original in a sense, and that's to provide policymakers and all citizens of the world with the best assessed, digested, if you wish, information uh, about the different dimensions of climate change, the science itself of the climate uh, system, the science of impacts and adaptation and vulnerability, and the, uh, the science, and when I say the science, it's in the broadest sense, the science of uh, emission reductions, uh, what we call mitigation. The three main questions that the IPCC uh, tried to uh, answer in its uh, last report, the fifth report, um, published uh, in 2013 and 2014, are the following. What is happening in the climate system? What are the risks? What can be done? And as I told you, I have too many slides. So, in one slide, I will attempt to summarize the 5,000 pages of that report. <laughs> so at least I have done that. And after, if I'm short of time at the end, you, you had the, the essential messages here. Human influence on the climate system is clear. This is a quotation from the last report. It doesn't contain any, ambigu any ambiguity. It's a clear message. Continued emissions of greenhouse gases will increase the likelihood of severe, pervasive, and sometimes irreversible impacts for people and ecosystems, and it's a general rule, unfortunately, as we heard yesterday, and this is also very well reflected in the IPCC report, that the poor uh, are most affected and first affected uh, in many uh, of those uh, impacts, and that's both in developing countries and in richer countries. While climate change is a threat to sustainable development, there are many opportunities to integrate mitigation, adaptation, and also, and that's very important, the pursuit of other societal objectives, such as increased um, uh, air quality or water quality, and um, improved energy and water access, access to clean energy, uh, eradication of poverty. There are ways to integrate uh, the fight against climate change or to adapt to climate change and the pursuit of some of those other goals. That's very important. In summary, humanity has the means 
to limit climate change and build a more sustainable and resilient future. Uh, one thing I forgot to mention is that I changed the title if you, of my speech. If you, if you read the title of my speech, you, you, you read that I spoke about the hidden message of the uh, IPCC report, and remember that, because I will reveal the hidden message only at the very end of my, my talk. Now, we're talking about climate change. Maybe first we, sh we need to make sure that climate is indeed changing. You know, there are people who are spending a lot of energy and sometimes money uh, to sow doubt about this um, issue. And I show you this kind of curve. You know, the temperature, the global temperature for the last 15 years. And, um, well, it's, it's hard to get a strong impression looking at, those, um, at that uh, figure that climate is warming, isn't it? Well, actually, you could have done that many times over the last 100 years by cherry-picking a starting date and a, an end date. And you could have argued that many times over the last century the temperature has been uh, cooling, has been decreasing, really. This is lying with statistics. This is cherry picking. You really need to take, to look at the trends. You need to look at uh, the, the whole series uh, and uh, remember also that climate is not defined over a 15 year period, but at least over a 30 year period. Actually, and this is from the last IPCC report, if you compute decadal averages, uh, you see that the last three decades have been successively warmer than each preceding decade, and even that the last 30-year period, as in the northern hemisphere at least, for which there are data, um, probably be the, um, the warmest of the last 1,400 years. The warmest of the last 1,400 years. But there are many other indicators that climate is indeed changing. Look at this glacier in Alaska. Uh, as it was in 1961. Look well where the ice is. This is where it was 10 years ago. Disappeared. This is the, the, uh, the behavior of most glaciers uh, in the world today. Melting glaciers contribute an additional amount of water to the oceans, and this is one of the factors leading to an increase in sea level at the average um, scale. Uh, sea levels has, average sea level has increased by approximately 20 centimeters over the last 100 years, as you can see here. And this is to a large extent due to the melting of glaciers. This is also due to the uh, expansion of water as it is heated, and it is starting also to be because the big ice sheets, Greenland and Antarctica, unfortunately, have started to melt as well. There are other changes in the atmosphere, in the climate system, happening. For example, the increase in the CO2 concentration measured here in Hawaii, on top of a dead volcano, uh, for the past uh, 50 years or so. And as you can see, we have reached uh, now uh, approximately 400 parts per million so we are talking here about the concentration in the atmosphere, the, percent, the percentage, but the CO2 percentage in the atmosphere is very small, so it's measured in parts per million, ppm, and we are now close to 400. But this is very new in the uh, recent history of the planet, because as you can see here, for the last 800,000 uh, years, I repeat, for the last 800,000 years, the concentration has only changed between approximately 180, 180, and 280 ppms. Remember, we are now at 400. So we have totally left the natural range of variations uh, observed and measured uh, in ice cores in Antarctica in particular over the last almost one million years. Why is this important? Why is this small quantity of, of a gas in the atmosphere so important? Well, because it's, it is um, changing the energy balance in the atmosphere. If we didn't have the so-called greenhouse effect, we would have a balance between the energy coming from the sun, shown in yellow here, 
and the infrared radiation, the heat that is emitted by the surface of the planet in response to the heating by the, uh, by the sun. And the balance between those two kinds of radiation, one visible, the other one invisible, uh, would lead to a temperature which on the average would be minus 18 degrees C. And life on this planet probably would not have evolved the way it has, and probably we wouldn't be here. If we didn't have gases first studied in depth by an Irish physicist, and since we are in Ireland, I'd like to pay a tribute to him, and that is John Tyndall, who spent dozens of hours, even weeks, in his lab with his instruments, measuring in the middle of the 19th century the absorption capacity of different gases in the atmosphere. And he concluded that water vapor, CO2, he didn't measure methane at the time, but methane came later, had the property of trapping that infrared radiation and trapping the heat close to the surface. And instead of having that minus 18 C that we would have without those greenhouse gases, uh, we have plus 15 approximately, plus 33 degrees. So the greenhouse effect is very useful. The problem is not the greenhouse effect, it's the excess of greenhouse effect, because if the CO2 concentration continues to increase, and if the concentration of other greenhouse gases, such as methane, which is also a greenhouse gas trapping heat close to the surface, well, the temperature is going to increase. You can see here, and this is the kind of diagram to study at home, if you are interested, you can see the relative uh, importance of the different gases. This is for CO2 on, on, a, me on, a, on, on, a, on a scale where the, the, the more to the right you are, the more important the warming effect is. Uh, this is the effect of methane, so it's far from insignificant. Uh, you have other gases as well. You have some factors, some pollution, air pollution factors, which also have a cooling effect. And this is the total. This is the total. And you see it's increasing uh, from what it was in 1950. And you also can see that it is much, much larger than the effect over the same time period, which is the last two, 250 years, basically. It's much larger than over the, last, the same time period the effect of solar irradiance, which is shown here. It's hard to, to distinguish from zero. So changes in solar activity have an effect on climate, uh, but it's very small compared to the effect of greenhouse gases and the increase in greenhouse gas concentration due to human activities over the last 100, uh, 150 years or so. I have been asked to uh, say a few words about methane in, in particular. So the concentration of methane has increased actually much more than the concentration of CO2. Its, its, its concentration has been multiplied by a factor of two since pre-industrial times. And this is mostly due to the massive um, uh, increase in the number of ruminants uh, the emissions from fossil fuel extraction as well, because um, you should know that natural gas is, is mostly constituted of methane, which is a, a powerful greenhouse gas. Uh, one kilogram of methane is equivalent to 25 kilograms of CO2, if you look at the effect of, over a century time period. And there are also emissions of methane from landfills and uh, organic waste. So it's important to understand and to try to quantify uh, the effect of different factors, as you have understood, because the climate system is influenced by solar radiation and the changes in solar activity, which I just mentioned, but it's also influenced by major, in a major way by greenhouse, uh, greenhouse gases. And I'd like to show here uh, the results of an old climate simulation made in my institute uh, more than, 20, uh, than uh, 15 years ago showing the separate effects over the last 150 years of greenhouse gases, that's the red curve in terms of warming, almost a degree, if only that factor was active, of the small changes in solar activity, and you see it has a warming effect, it has had a warming effect, 
but much smaller than the greenhouse gases, and also sometimes it's an increase, sometimes it's a decrease. Uh, you have the green curve showing the effect of volcanoes, because when there's a big uh, volcanic eruption, there's a cooling effect because of all the dust causing some shadow effects and preventing some of the solar heat to uh, reach the surface. And then the blue curve there, the, the blue curve there is coming from the, the classic air pollution. And it also has a, a shadowing effect, a cooling effect. When you combine all those factors, actually, uh, that relatively old model now, 15 year old, was quite able to reproduce uh, the, the black curve, which is the observed temperature. So the models are very important tools in, in the, uh, in the uh, study of the climate system. And uh, uh, the, this, these tools are used to, um, uh, today to quantify uh, the solidity of the link between human activities and climate change. Because if there isn't a solid link, and if it was only human factors, well, it would be hard, harder, at least, to discuss climate justice and, and the, the, the contribution of humans uh, to, to the uh, solution to the problems. Um, so I'd like to show you, again, this observed temperature curve uh, and the result of two types of simulations made with modern models but it's uh, in a very similar way to, to what I've just shown you uh, for the different uh, factors. The blue curve is obtained by forcing the model, by feeding the, the climate models only with natural factors. Natural factors being uh, mostly uh, the, cha the small changes in solar activity and the volcanic eruptions. And the red curve is obtained by forcing, feeding the models with all factors not only the natural factors, but also the human factors, the greenhouse gases, and the classic air pollution. And as you can see, at the time of the assessment report number one, AR1, in IPCC, that was published in 1990, well, there was a difference between the blue curve and the red curve, and the red, red curve is um, uh, closer to the uh, observed temperature, but the, the, the thick curves are at the averages, and some of the simulations were, were not, um, uh, there was a range around those averages. And so the IPCC scientists were very cautious. They didn't accept this as sufficient to conclude in 1990 uh, that um, human activity was really needed to explain the warming. So it said, an equivocal detection is not likely for a decade. Actually, a decade was not needed because in 95, at the time of the AR2, the assessment report number two, it said the balance of evidence suggests a discernible influence of human activities over the last 50 years. Then, as time went by, as you can see, the divergence between the two types of simulations increased. It became clearer and clearer that without the human factors, there was no way to reproduce the observed temperature evolution. And so in 2001, it said most of the warming of the past 50 years is likely, likely means two chances out of three, due to human activities, et cetera, et cetera, sorry. Uh, and to, to the last report, the last report said it's extremely likely, a probability of 95%, that human influence has been the dominant cause. So there is a link between the uh, increase in the concentration of greenhouse gases in the atmosphere and the warming. But we have to understand where that increase in the concentration of CO2 in particular, CO2 is the main human uh, greenhouse gas. Uh, it's about causing 80% 80, 80 of the uh, increase in the heat trapping around the planet. So we have to understand a little better uh, the connection between emissions of CO2 and the increase of the CO2 concentration in the atmosphere. And this, this slide is a slide I will spend a little more time uh, because I think it's very important and very policy relevant, actually. <clears throat> 
First, um, in this unperturbed carbon cycle, you have two big loops. Exchanges between soils and vegetation on the left loop and the atmosphere, and the numbers there are labeled in gigatons of carbon, billion tons of carbon per year. Emission, a little less than 120, 120. <coughs> Absorption, 120 gigatons per year. The same for the oceans, a big loop there. Emissions in the warmer part of the oceans of a little more than 70 billion tons per year. Absorption uh, of 70 billion tons per year. Um, in the colder part of the ocean because water, cold water absorbs CO2 better than warm water. Now, we have perturbed uh, these um, big loops which were perfectly in balance because if you add up the numbers you had 190 going up, 190 going down, so as long as those numbers were equal, even they were, if the numbers are high, the uh, CO2 amount in the atmosphere remains perfectly stable. But we have affected this delicate balance, this delicate balance which had been stable for the last 10,000 years, um, in this way. And these numbers are for the last decade of the 20th century, but we're just explaining the process. So unfortunately, the numbers have increased, but to explain the process, we can do it with, we can do this with these numbers. So emissions were of the order of 8 billion tons at the time per year, 8 billion tons of carbon per year. And if you translate the increase in the concentration that was observed into an absolute amount, a quantity of additional carbon, additional CO2 in the atmosphere, you came up with the conclusion that uh, what was added every year was 3.2 billion tons of carbon in the atmosphere. So there's um, a mystery there at first sight. We, are, we were emitting 8 billion tons, mostly through the burning of fossil fuel, coal, oil and gas, to a lesser extent also through deforestation. And a little less than one half of that was found in the atmosphere as uh, a, remain, uh, a remaining quantity. Well, the other, the other half, I'm rounding numbers, actually was absorbed uh, by vegetation, by increased uh, absorption by vegetation and soils, and also in part by the oceans. So, CO2 accumulates in the atmosphere because we are emitting approximately two times more than what natural systems can absorb. So without any climate models, uh, a first approach in terms of numbers of the reductions in emissions that would be need, needed just to stabilize the problem, stabilize the thickness of the CO2 layer around the atmosphere, is a division by two. But that's only a very rough calculation. But it helps to understand the order of magnitude of what, what we're talking about. And this, by the way, doesn't involve any complicated climate model. This is just arithmetics. Since natural systems absorb half of what we emit, well, we have to emit one half of what we emit now so that there is a balance. Well, that's a simplified calculation, of course. But it helps to understand the order of magnitude of what we are talking about. But it's more difficult than that for many reasons. One reason, for example, is that vegetation is, is absorbing part of what we are emitting, but we are also deforesting. So, of course, we are cutting, literally, the branch on which we are seated because we are destroying some of the absorptive capacity uh, that is helping us. And also, as climate is warming, and as I told you, water absorbs CO2 better when it's cold, well, there will be less and less absorption in the ocean in the long term. So if there's less absorption, at least that it means that the, the, the proportion, the quantity that will remain in the atmosphere 
will become pro pro progressively larger. For all those reasons, dividing emissions by two is actually not enough to um, really uh, stabilize the, the temperature. This, the understanding of this carbon cycle, the main elements of this carbon cycle, is very important because it's also related uh, to climate justice, actually. Because it means that emissions, which mostly occurred in developed countries up to now, in terms of global percentage, have accumulated in the atmosphere and remain, I mean, a part of those, remain in the atmosphere for a long time. Uh, which means that it's not only today's emissions which matter, it's also past emissions, historical emissions. And, and of course, this is known uh, in the climate negotiations, and it's a very important uh, aspect uh, to take into account. And it also is related to something I'll um, discuss a little later, uh, the fact that the warming is very much a function of the accumulated emissions of carbon, uh, which led to the notion of carbon space and narrowing carbon space as emissions uh, are continuing. Where are those uh, CO2, global CO2 emissions coming from in terms of activity? Well, mostly uh, as far as the um, uh, CO2 is concerned from fossil fuel burning and to a lesser extent, as I said, from deforestation. In terms of sector, and sorry, uh, the, the black is not very readable there, my apologies. 35% uh, from the energy sector, that's the, the biggest um, um, circle there. 24% uh, from agriculture, forest, and other land users, uh, so a significant amount. And we're talking here not on CO2, but uh, overall greenhouse gas emissions, so including methane, N2O, uh, CFCs and other, other gases uh, which have a greenhouse effect. 21% industry, 14% transport, and 6.4% um, the building sector. Now that we have understood that human activities uh, really play a very important role in the observed warming, we can look at the future. And to look at the future, we have to use scenarios for the possible evolution of the concentration of CO2 and other gases. And this is for CO2, the four main scenarios considered. From the red scenario on the top, which is a business as usual scenario in our jargon, my apologies for the complexity of the name, it's called the RCP 8.5. Uh, and the bottom scenario at the other extreme, which is called the RCP 2.6 and which, as you can see, stabilizes essentially over the next 300 centuries uh, the concentration more or less at the present level or slightly below. This is for CO2. You have the same here for methane. Uh, you can look at that um, uh, later. Uh, and this is what happens when you feed those numbers, those scenarios to climate models and I only, only show you the two extremes, the, the top scenario, which is essentially a business as usual scenario, and the lower scenario. And you can see that the lower scenario provides an increase in temperature uh, of approximately one, degrees, one degree Celsius above the present temperature. But we have had a warming of a little less than one degree already. So this is approximately a two degree warming while the business as usual scenario, the red scenario, leads, thank you, leads to um, uh, an increase in temperature of the order of four degrees above uh, the present temperature, uh, or, and that means five degrees above pre-industrial. This is a bit abstract because these are average numbers. Let's look at what it means, for example, for India, for the top scenario in the worst case. Uh, this is um, on top of the high temperature India has, and you may have uh, heard a few weeks ago uh, the, um, the, the, uh, the news about the, uh, the death of a few thousand people because of heat waves just before the monsoon arrived in India. So if you add up several uh, degrees, five, seven, up to five or seven degrees in India by the end of the century, uh, you can imagine uh, 
uh, the uh, human uh, consequences uh, in that region. It would also, sorry for the French, uh, it would also be uh, changes uh, in, um, in the amount of precipitation on the left for the lower scenario, on the right for the, ups, the top scenario. Uh, and uh, here, uh, for example, in Northern Europe, in the top scenario, uh, it would mean in most of Northern Europe, and Ireland is part of that, an increase in the uh, uh, average uh, precipitation amount, while in North Africa and the southern part of Europe, it would mean a decrease with all the impacts you can imagine on agriculture. Sea level is due to continue to increase, of course, much more in the top scenario than in the bottom scenario, but sea level is, uh, has a lot of inertia uh, in the system, so it would still increase uh, in the lower scenario by at least 30 centimeters by the end of the century. One meter by the end of the century Again, to, to make this a little more concrete, uh, this is what it means in the Nile Delta. For example, 10 million people were living 15 years ago, I don't know what the number to, is today, uh, in the red zone shown here, which is the zone which is at less than one meter above the, uh, the sea level. So you can imagine even half a meter would, means, uh, would mean millions of people uh, affected. It also changes in the uh, acidity of the oceans, uh, which is shown here, uh, the lower the number, the higher the acidity, again for the two scenarios, and it's much worse in the red scenario than in the, the, the blue scenario. Acidity has never uh, changed much over the last 25 million years, and of course it would affect, hu um, not human life directly, but uh, marine life uh, to have a much more acidic <coughs> ocean, and you can see how large those changes uh, that are projected are compared to the uh, changes reconstructed for the last 25 million years. It would also mean uh, changing climate changes in the extremes. Uh, for example, more extreme hot days, more uh, intense uh, precipitation. Uh, for Europe, it's, um, including for Ireland, of course, it means a very significant uh, seasonal changes in heavy precipitation in winter in particular, what is shown here, the AGF means December, January, February, um, but also um, in many other areas. For example, in Kenya, a, a study that's uh, quoted in the IPCC report uh, estimated that under a range of scenarios by 2050, more than 300,000 people could be flooded per year under high emission scenario. So impacts are really underway in, in a very wide manner, from the tropicals to the pole on all continents and the ocean, uh, affecting rich and poor, but as I said, uh, the poor are more vulnerable everywhere. And this is illustrated uh, on this picture showing um, something happening during the Katrina a tropical storm 10 years ago, and reminding us that risk is not only a function of the uh, geophysical hazards, the changes in uh, uh, physical parameter like sea level or intensity of wind during a tropical storm or whatever, but it's also uh, a function of vulnerability and exposure, which are very much socioeconomic uh, factors, and you can imagine that a black handicapped person in the middle of New Orleans is much more vulnerable uh, than uh, someone uh, who has the means to escape uh, the city uh, with his uh, SUV. So the potential impacts of climate change are very, very wide. Food and water shortages, increased poverty, increased displacement of people, coastal, coastal flooding are just a few of the examples. And in many, um, in, actually in all regions of the world, and I know this is too small, this is again something to look at um, at home, uh, it impacts uh, in many sectors, uh, going from agriculture to health to uh, forestry, have been attributed to climate change already. The, and this is with the small amount of climate change we have had up to now. In front of that, um, those emerging impacts, and this is just unfortunately only the beginning, Adaptation is already occurring in many places in the world. In, in the world. For example, here in Bangladesh, uh, and this is for um, 
uh, Monsignor Gomez, where, where is he? Uh, I saw him this morning. Yes, there he is. Um, uh, there, 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 is there, there are adaptation efforts to, 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 to create some refuge so that there is a, when there is a storm surge, um, uh, people can, can, can uh, escape uh, the floods. But adaptation has, in this area and in all other uh, sectors as well, its limits, as shown by this diagram showing the increasing risk level with uh, climate change uh, in two scenarios in particular, a world which warms by two degrees, where the warming is limited to two degrees by the end of the century, a world where it's limited to four degrees by the end of the century. And you see, and this is a con the conceptual, uh, a conceptual diagram, I will now illustrate something real uh, in, in a second, you see the um, risk level uh, which increases when you go from the two-degree world to the four-degree world. You also see what is dashed here, uh, the um, amount of risk that can be reduced through adaptation. So adaptation in the example here, in the conceptual example here, has the potential to decrease uh, the, the risk, which is most welcome. But as you can see here, uh, the potential is not infinite, and, and it doesn't reduce the risk to zero. And also the potential might not be the same in a two-degree world and in a four-degree world. So let's be a little more specific now and look at Africa, where uh, regional key risk have been assessed by IPCC in its latest reports for three important sectors, water, food security, and health. And look at Food security in particular, we don't have the time to look at everything, but look at sec food security. There is a potential in a two degree world to decrease risk from a high value to a medium value, which is better than leave it at high, but it doesn't reduce the risk to zero, by the way. But look at the potential, which is extremely limited uh, uh, with adaptation to reduce the risk in a four degree world in the area of food security in Africa. So adaptation, yes, adaptation is very important, but it needs to be complemented, and this has been done for all regions of the world. This needs to be complemented by mitigation because risk of climate change increase with continued high emissions. And then there is that notion of cumulated uh, emissions and, and leading to the carbon budget arising. Because if you map, and this is one of the new diagram in the latest, latest IPCC report, if you map the um, warming, which is the vertical axis, in function of the cumulative emissions, that means the total emissions, when you add year after year the emission to what has been emitted from the beginning of when you have data actually here in the middle of the 19th century, you have something that's almost linear, as you can see. And when you do that kind of computation for the future, using the four scenarios, you see that whatever the scenarios, and of course there are some uncertainties around the, the results, you have a kind of linear relationship between the, cumul the accumulated emissions and the warming. And this is very important. Because it means that if you want to limit, for example, to two degrees the warming, you have, of course with some uncertainty, you have uh, an absolute maximal quantity of CO2 that can be emitted in the atmosphere. As you can see, if you take approximately the middle here of this curve for two degrees, it's a little less than 3,000 billion tons of CO2, okay? Which is shown another way on this carbon budget diagram, uh, if you want to, to, to stay with a probability that's not so high after all, probability of a little more than two, two, times out of, two changes out of three, if you want to stay under a two degree warming, well the budget then, in, under that hypothesis, is a little less than 3,000 billion tons. The only problem is that we have emitted, and I say we, as I said before, it's mostly developed countries, more than two-thirds of those um, 1900, uh, tons, uh, 1900 billion tons of CO2 have been emitted by developed countries, so there's a, a remaining amount of the order of 1,000 gigatons, and this was 
uh, in, until 2011, uh, and we are emitting approximately 40 billion tons per year, so you see that there is some, and this is a euphemism, urgency. Another way to look at this is to see how the blue scenario I showed you earlier, the RCP 2.6, which is the only scenario leading to some stabilization close to the two degree warming, uh, how it's, how it's uh, compatible in terms of um, uh, emissions uh, of CO2 uh, equivalents, um, uh, so total greenhouse gases, with time over the coming 100 years. And as you can see, uh, this uh, scenario, this family of scenarios leading to a stabilization of the warming around two degrees actually crosses the zero line here well before the end of the century. So this means that well before the end of the century, it's a decarbonization of the world economy uh, that's needed. But the observed trend is going another way because the emissions are increasing. These are the observed emissions at the world scale. The emissions are increasing. Now, there's a whole chapter I have in my presentation which I have not been asked to cover, and I know my time is up. Uh, but I have provided slides because I think it's important to, to have some information on those aspects uh, because they are in the IPCC report also and they will allow me also to say one word about the hidden message. So the IPCC says it is possible to mitigate, it is technically and economically feasible to keep the warming below two degrees. You will hear much more uh, from other speakers about mitigation and about what is possible. But I will, I will skip and, 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 and go to the, uh, uh, to the hidden message because you're probably uh, curious uh, what the hidden message is. Um, the hidden message is that it's possible. On the other hand, you see that the trends are not at all going in, in, that, um, in that direction up to now, because the emissions are still increasing, while if you want to go to zero, you have to peak and uh, reduce. Uh, so what is lacking? Well, that's a hidden message of the IPCC report. What is lacking up to now, at least, is political will at the appropriate scale. Thank you very much for your attention.